The genetics revolution is already shaping healthcare, and most people see in it the potential for healthier children, healthier adults, and less disease. But today's guest argues that the same technology making progress possible has the potential to saddle the world with a complex array of thorny ethical questions that will affect everything from human sexual reproduction to national security. He's Jamie Metzl this week on Story in the Public Square. Welcome to a Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Each week, we talk about big issues with great guests, authors, journalists, artists, and more, to make sense of the stories that shape public life in the United States today. To help us this week, we're joined by Jamie Metzl, a technology and healthcare futurist, a geopolitical expert, a novelist, entrepreneur, and media commentator. He's also the author of an important new book, Hacking Darwin, Genetic Engineering and the Future of Humanity. Jamie, thank you so much for being with us. Really my pleasure to be here, Jim. So when we talk about this genetic revolution, what are we talking about? So you guys know and your viewers know that genetics is the source code of life. Um, and people know that when your father's sperm fertilizes your mother's egg and your one cell, that cell has the blueprint for who you have the potential to be. And that code is your genetic code. And all of life shares genetic code. It, it tells a different story, but it's made of the same building blocks of the A's and C's and T's and G's. And the essence of this genetics revolution, which builds on 150 years of scientific advance, is that all of a sudden our little species, this one little group of monkeys essentially who climbed down from the trees and stood up to peer over the grass, our one little species suddenly has the increasing ability to read, write, and hack the code of all of life, including our own. And it's this unbelievable power that for millennia we have attributed to our gods the ability to change life, to change species, to build life from scratch, to confer something that feels like immortality. And this is, it's an incredible godlike power. And we suddenly have it. And the question for us is, can we generate enough wisdom to use this incredibly Promethean power wisely. And that's the challenge of this moment. We've only got 30 minutes for the show, but I have a feeling <laughs> yeah. that we're gonna use a lot of it, all of it. Um, you know, so when you talk about this in terms of it's hacking Darwin and in, in, in the analogy uh, that, you, that you spin in the book is that this is a, the new information technology. How literal can we take that? How, how precise can genetic engineering actually be? It can be extremely precise because when we think about computer code, what do we think of? It's written in these ones and zeros. And genetic code is written in these A's and C's and T's and G's. And genetic code is much more complex than computer code. But that doesn't mean it's infinitely complex. And one way to think about this is right now, when we, using the tools that we have today, try to understand simple organisms like bacteria or model organisms like C. elegans roundworms, we can understand them pretty well uh, because of how much we've studied them and because the sophistication of our measuring tools is a match for the complexity of their relatively simple biology. But our biology, is about as complex as it's been for millions of years. But the sophistication of our tools is on an exponential J curve. So it's getting not just linearly more sophisticated, but exponentially. And so there will come a time relatively soon where the sophistication of our tools meets and then exceeds the complexity of our biology. And then we will be 
as simple, as relatively simple to those tools of tomorrow as the round worms are compared to the complexity of the tools that we have, uh, have today. And so all of these things that seem like inexplicably complex systems will become more and more understandable and therefore more hackable. Where is this technology being developed? Private sector, government sector, and what are the ambitions? And I realize there yeah. are a lot of answers to this yeah. one question. Sure. Start with where. I mean, can you yeah. tell us where? So geographically where, the two biggest centers are the United States and China, but that doesn't discount that there are lots of other places like Europe, Australia, New Zealand, where there's lots of really important work uh, uh, being done. And then who is doing it? A lot of it, the basic research is coming out primarily of universities, and it's unbelievable um, what, is, what is happening. It's moving so quickly. Every day there's another paper coming out of a university somewhere that if that same paper had been published 10 years ago, it would have received a Nobel Prize. But now it's just a normal day in, in science. And then there there's, are these massive industries uh, that are growing all around the world, which are taking this basic science, again, primarily, but not exclusively coming out of universities, and translating that into these companies that are, are growing at an incredible rate. And then there are governments, certainly the United States and China, that are recognizing the benefits um, across the board of how the applications of these technologies and are investing massively. China was a little late to the game, but they have, have identified genetics and biotech as one of the key areas for investment. And investment meaning that China has a national plan to become the world leading country by 2050, and leading science and technology is the way that they are planning to do that. And they're so, investing massively in these areas. So, so do these parties and these researchers have an understanding of the power they are unlocking or unleashing? So yes and no. Um, yes, probably they recognize that there is this big story, but I lecture all the time. I give mm -hmm. keynote talks to thousands of doctors, and I was just giving a, a keynote um, to 300 top scientists at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And the reason why I'm going to speak to them about science, where they are actually in the trenches, is that pretty much everybody, whether you're a cancer researcher work, working on cancer genetics, uh, whether you're in a national lab working on one little piece of the story, by definition, you are focusing on the problem in front of you. If I'm working on cancer genetics, the question that I'm asking myself is how can we hack genetic code to defeat cancer? I'm generally not asking myself the question of if we are developing this tool to rewrite the genetic code, what are the big picture implications? And that's a fundamental question that needs to be asked. Well, that's, that's, that's for you. me. That, I mean, I don't know what to mean, me and other people. Yeah. That's why we're, we're, that I, certainly that's why I'm focusing as I am. That's why I'm part of the World Health Organization International Advisory Committee on Human Genome Editing. And, and we're 18 of us from all around the world. Uh, and we're meeting six times in Geneva over the next year. And the, the, the remit from the director general of the World Health Organization, who's this really incredible person, is that we need to start making, outlining, trying to outline what can and should be the rules of the road for how we can guide or try to guide the application of these incredibly powerful technologies. And that, that's the challenge of this moment. What we need to do is find a way so that our most sacred, values, our greatest ethical traditions, which in many cases are very old, can guide the application of our most powerful technologies. But of course we know, history has told us time and time again that rules of the road are not followed necessarily by everyone. That's exactly and right. That's and that's the, the risk challenge. here, is that not? 100%, and, and that's why the mission, as I see it, is we, are, there's a race, and there's a race, is can we build norms quickly enough so that they can guide the application of these technologies that are really racing forward. And so we have examples where norms have actually worked. I mean, it's better than not in whether it's nuclear power or biological weapons or even with, with climate change. I mean, there have been imperfect processes, but those processes have been better than nothing. We haven't had, right. and we've had certainly you know, chemical warfare in Syria, but it could have been a lot worse. 
Uh, we haven't had biological warfare, even though it, it could have been. Even with climate change, a lot of people, myself included, are really frustrated that we're not doing more with climate change. But we've actually built a global infrastructure. There are meetings, international meetings. There are people who are measuring it. There's a movement of young people and others who are campaigning um, to protect the environment. We don't have any of that infrastructure in place around the genetics revolution. But as I see it, the genetics revolution is among the greatest transformation, uh, certainly of our lifetimes, but maybe even in the history of our species. So let's break this <coughs> down a little bit, sort of at the, at the individual level. What, is this, what does this revolution mean for just you know, our audience, for yeah. me, for, for us such, around the table? It's such a great question. So there are three primary ways where the genetics revolution is going to touch us, and it's already happening. The first is in our healthcare. So we right now live in a world of generalized medicine based on population averages. And what that means is, when you go to your doctor, by and large, your doctor treats you based on your being a human being. And so when, when your doctor prescribes a medication, for example, it's, well, this medication works for whatever the number, 40%, 50%, 70% of people, we're going to try it on you. If it does, we'll find out if you're a non-responder by you take the drug. And then we'll, if it doesn't kill you, we'll try, we'll try something else. And now, excuse me. And, and, now, and you see that most especially, or certainly <coughs> in in terms of mental health issues, people living Everything. with depression or schizophrenia. Yeah, yeah. So they, they try they something. They try, it doesn't work, doesn't we work. try, try again, try we keep, yeah, exactly. That's the way we do it. It's better than everything we've ever done. Yeah, it's better than past. nothing, certainly. <clears throat> but it's not as good as what we're, where we're going. And where we're going is to this world of personalized or precision medicine based on in each person's individual biology. And so when you go to your doctor, your doctor is going to say, based on your individual biology, <clears throat> we believe that this is, or I believe, that this is a treatment that will work for you. But how's your doctor going to know who you are? And the way they're going to know who you are is by having your, your personal history, your family history, your biometric information, other tests, but the foundation of your electronic health record will be your sequenced genome. And everyone's going to have their genome sequenced pretty much after birth. Like they, just now you get your heel, pl heel prick blood test, you'll have your whole genome sequenced and it's possible because the cost of whole genome Human sequencing has gone down from about a billion dollars in 2003 to $600 today, and it's going towards essentially nothing within, within a decade. Then we're going to have these massive databases of billions of people, genetic and life information. And then we will use big data analytics to crack the code of complex genetics and biology more generally. And what that means is that you're going to get treated based on your individual biology, but it's even more. Because right now you go to the doctor when you have a symptom, but maybe if it's a, a genetic disorder, that symptom began, or that disease began at the moment of conception, mm -hmm. when your father's sperm fertilized your mother's egg, that's when your harmful genetic mutation showed up. Maybe it took 50 years for it to be realized. And so now we're going to have people from the moment of of birth or maybe even soon after conception, where well, your parents are going to know this, your child has an increased risk of getting type 2 diabetes or early onset familial Alzheimer's or <clears throat> anything. But then it's, it's bigger than that because we don't have a disease genome, we have a human genome. And so everything that has a genetic foundation, we're going to be able to increasingly predict, not in a, in a binary way, a yes or no, but in a, in a probabilistic way. And so what has a genetic foundation? Personality style, genetic component of IQ, height, all sorts of, uh, of things. And so that's the, the second transformation is we're going to have to shift the way we think about what a human is and how somebody becomes. Because if you are a parent and you know that your kid um, has a, a uh, greater than average possibility of being fantastic at abstract math or physics or sprinting, you may want to have that information. And you may think differently about the different opportunities you provide to your children based on a sense of what they could be good at. It doesn't mean they will be or, or not. And then just very, very quickly, and we, then the third application will be the fundamental transformation, not just in the way that we make babies, and we're going to take conception outside of the human and increasingly uh, conceive um, through uh, in vitro uh, and, and use embryo selection, 
but also in changing the nature of the babies we make, first through embryo selection of in vitro embryos, deciding which to implant, and then through the application of gene editing tools like CRISPR, but better than CRISPR, uh, to make a small number of changes to pre-implanted embryos. And all this raises, obviously, fundamental huge. ethical questions. Huge, yes. huge issues. Yes. So, so, but, so uh, you know, let, let's, let's, let's unpack some of that. Mm. Um, you know, there, in, in the West, uh, there are all sorts of ethical issues uh, associated with, um, uh, you know, in, in the Catholic tradition especially, right. with, with the fertilization of eggs. Right. Uh, and when does human life begin? Right. And what are the ethical boundaries yeah. associated with that? I mean, this is this is what you're what you're describing seems to me to be the end of natural selection. Well, let me address both of those things. Yeah. So, I was in the Vatican uh, about a month ago, meeting with cardinals and bishops and others, talking about exactly this issue, and it's really, really difficult. And there are many different faith and non-faith uh, traditions, uh, and but we're all humans, and so we're going to have to find a way to talk about this, to, to discuss, and to figure out what do we want to be legal, and not everything, just because something is possible, doesn't mean it needs to be legal. It doesn't mean we should even do it. But we have to be having these, uh, these conversations. But it was interesting uh, for me because in Alabama, um, which uh, recently created the, the country's strongest anti-abortion law, the state senator who led that process put in a carve out for these uh, fertilized embryos in uh, in vitro uh, fertility centers. And when asked why he did it, the answer was, well, we're talking about, um, uh, about embryos inside of a person, not just some cells in a lab. If you believe that life begins at conception, wouldn't you say that, well, no, any fertilized egg in any lab anywhere, that's life. Why didn't they say that? The reason is, as, at least as I see, is because people are in all these churches. And then they're seeing these older parents or high-risk parents who are showing up with kids that they otherwise wouldn't or couldn't have. And they're saying, wow, this is a miracle. And we need to recognize there are de definitely some things we need to be afraid of. But this is a miracle. I mean, this is the miracle of life. And I don't think it's good when some young kid dies of a deadly genetic disorder. I don't think, oh, that's, that's fate. It just is the same way when somebody my own age or a friend gets cancer. I don't say, oh, that your fate is cancer. Let's not give you any health care we recognize that, that biology is buggy. Yeah. And we don't just accept those bugs, we, we, we fight them. But, but there's the wonderful story and there's the dangerous story and both are parts of what's happening. And we have to be excited about the great stuff and we have to be worried about the negative stuff. Well, so, and then how, you know, the way we typically resolve these big thorny issues is through politics, Yes. right? Um, are we even engaged in this debate in a meaningful way in, in, no. in the United States or anywhere else you for know, that matter? The answer is no, but some places are, are better than others. In the United States, we can't even hardly have the debate because once it feels like the abortion debate, right. just as you, you talked about the embryos, yeah, yeah. everybody jumps behind the, the barricades. Yeah. But you look at a country like the United Kingdom, which is really well regulated, in many ways better regulated than here in the United States, and when they were having their national debate about whether to authorize clinical trials of a procedure called mitochondrial transfer, which is, mm -hmm. it's a little bit complicated, but um, basically um, uh, mitochondria are the power packs in, of the cell. If you think of the cell as an egg, there's the nucleus, um, which is the egg yolk, and the cytoplasm, which is the egg white. The mitochondria, um, are in the egg white, and so there's a, a mitochondrial transfer um, therapy, which is if there is a mother primarily who has mitochondrial disease, who pa would pass it to her children, you swap out the mother's egg white in her egg with a donor's egg white, and, and so it, it's, it's a big deal, but there's a small amount of mitochondrial DNA that would pass on to these offspring forever. So that's why they call it the quote unquote three parent babies. And in the UK, they had a three-year national debate, public forums all around the country. Um, then they had an open forum, um, uh, an open uh, vote of both houses of parliament, which authorized um, their regulatory agency, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, which is amazing, to provide licenses to clinics to provide this, uh, this procedure. And then on an individual basis, those clinics wanting to, do, to apply it in one case, 
had to apply for a specific license for each application. And so if, the, you, if you're in the UK, you think, yes, this is really serious. This is life. It has to be regulated. But there's an infrastructure for it. Mm -hmm. And here, the FDA is incredible, but we don't have enough of an infrastructure. And this is an international issue. And to, to the question, do we have, we're not having the debate here. That's why I've written Hacking Darwin. That's why in the paperback version um, of Hacking Darwin, which is coming out in April, uh, there's a political guide to say, like, this is the most important issue of our generation. Our political leaders aren't thinking about it. They're not talking about it. Here are five questions that you can ask your political leaders. And so I think that this is a, this is a time where our, our political structure is shifting. We're moving from a represent, representative system to a popular and even a populist system. Switzerland has a popular uh, democracy, and they have a really well-educated populace. Mm -hmm. If we're going to have a popular democracy, we better make sure that we're all educated, that we're all empowered citizens, and we are not just asking, but demanding that our political leaders pay attention to some of these tremendous challenges. I like a lot of the positive future that you sketch out, mm -hmm. particularly in terms of healthcare. Yeah. But I keep coming back to the opportunity for mischief or worse. Yes. And um, so I, I have a question to that end. Sure. The databases that will be collected, how will they be secure? Right. Who will have access to them? And we know that you can hack into pretty much anywhere. Right. Can you not see tremendous potential here for misuse and, and yeah. worse? Ab there is a tremendous potential for misuse. We have to be honest about it. We can't just be Pollyanna and say, oh, no, there, there's, there's no, right. no problem. Um, but we need these big data pools because that is way, in, a, in a world of big data. I mean, it's not just about healthcare. I mean, certainly with autonomous cars and just life, these big data pools are the places where we are as a society going to glean insights that help us drive more carefully, live safer lives, live longer. I mean, that's where the insights come from. And that's why this issue of privacy is so complicated because we all have this gut instinct that more privacy is better. But it's not true. We need the right amount of, of privacy because if everybody has complete privacy and we don't have these, these big data sets, I mean, right now, a million people die a year from car accidents. If we're going to have um, autonomous vehicles, those autonomous vehicles need to learn from data sets. What are those data sets? If we want to transition from this world of generalized to precision healthcare, um, we need big data sets to basically crack the code of, of biology. And, and, and I wonder how many people will act actually object. I mean, look at 23andMe. Yeah. And Ancestry.com, no, people, people just, offer, people including myself, it. offer yeah. it up or we get genetic there, relatives and do you want to meet this person there, who may be a third cousin and there's we a, voluntarily yeah. offer it up. No, yeah. Knowing, certainly in my case and I guess everyone's yeah. case, there's a potential even there today with that technology, crude by what we're yeah. looking at in terms of the future, that there could be mischief. Well, how many people even read the release form that they sign when they go on 23 and me right or, or because it'll yeah exactly <laughs> um, so, i read the first so, okay bit of it. good good so so there's a company in boston that is going to um, marathons and triathlons and they just put up a big booth and it says give blood for the common good and so these people they've just run a race they're all these do gooders and say like, oh i'm for the common good i know when the american red cross puts out give blood that's a really good thing to do you're saving all these people's lives so people line up and they get there and they have this iPad, oh, here's the, here's the release, and people just, uh, maybe one person's ever read it, and they kind of scroll through 20 pages that of release. That one person is still reading it exactly. so long. And then they sign. But the release is saying basically giving over all rights really? to this genetic information. Oh, wow. And like 23andMe has a $300 million investment from GlaxoSmithKline. GlaxoSmithKline isn't doing it because they want people to know right. that their ancestors right. come from Siberia. <laughs> They're doing because this is this is medically not just medically this is life actionable information and so there are so there are some protections by law like here in the United States they have the uh, Genetic Information Non Disclosure Act GINA which kind of protects you against discrimination in health insurance doesn't protect you at all in life insurance and so we have this mismatch where people aren't protected. 
people don't realize how valuable their genetic information is. And so they're giving it to all of these providers. And these providers, like 23andMe, like Ancestry, their business model is not selling a bunch of kits to individual people. As a matter of fact, they should be paying you to give them that information. And we, but we don't have this level of sophistication either in the public or in our elected it, leaders. It's the same thing we, we do with all of our data and information in terms of Facebook yeah. and Google. And yeah. Jamie, we've only got about a minute, I a little bit more so than a minute more. left. Yeah. And so, I, you know, in, earlier in your life, you were a member of the National Security Council staff. Yeah. You're a respected national security analyst. It seems to me like there is a huge, uh, that we haven't yet discussed, right. uh, national security side of this. Yes. Literally in the minute we have yeah. left. Can you just tease us with that? I believe this will be one of the biggest national security issues of our generations. And there will be lots of ways that it, it plays out. One is access to data. We're already seeing this rivalry between the United States and China, and these data walls are, are, are going up. Um, second, uh, what happens if one society starts ma making decisions about whether to genetically optimize their population in ways that another society isn't comfortable with? Can you? because we're all humans, and so if somebody else makes a different decision, um, what are we going to do? Are we going to stop them? Are we going to protest? Are we going to invade them? I mean, countries have invaded other countries for less, and if we don't have rules of the road, if we can't develop global norms, this could be extremely destabilizing. And then within societies, what happens if there are people who start making different decisions? We've seen what happened on genetically modified organisms and abortion. If you were worried about GMOs, imagine how you're going to feel when the issue is GMHs. This is a huge issue, and yes. this is a hugely important book. Jamie Metzl, thank you so much. The book is Hacking Darwin. It's important. You want to check it out. That's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about storing the public square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org, where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.